So last time we talked about we talked about the mathematics of noise. We understood some of the basic we reviewed some of the basic mathematics behind analyzing stochastic signals like noise that we deal with electronics with in electronics. And also then we talked about some of the physics stuff. We talked about the different kinds of noise mechanisms. We saw the Johnson noise, sometimes it's just as white noise or thermal noise. And we saw it's not really white, we saw what it was, we saw the total power, it was finite really because it's not white, but then we saw that you can approximate it as a white noise for all intents and purposes because at the temperatures that you're interested in, the point at which this, the non-whiteness becomes important is like in tens of terahertz. So for the kind of circuits that we are dealing with, that for all intents and purposes you can assume it's white. So that was one thing. The other thing is, then, so, and we saw some of the properties. We saw that if you have a capacitor in parallel with a resistor, the noise is really determined by the capacitor. The integrated total voltage, mean squared voltage, is really determined by kT over C. And, um, and we saw that you could calculate that by integrating the noise over the whole bandwidth, or you could basically simply use the equipartition theorem and say each degree of freedom has one half kT, and capacitor has one degree of freedom, so the energy of the capacitor is equal to one half kT. So that gives you the kt over c for voltage factor to the square, to the square, uh, the square. Now, and then, then we saw other kinds of noise sources. We saw that thermal noise, we, you saw that you have thermal noise only when you have dissipation. Only in dissipated. There's a theorem from statistical mechanics that basically tells you, it's called fluctuation and dissipation, and that's very useful. That, that it tells you that to have noise, to have fluctuation, you need to have dissipation. Only dissipative elements. The elements that dissipate energy and convert them to heat will exhibit thermal or Johnson noise. Now, we said there are other kinds of noise sources that we saw. In particular, one was shot noise. Shot noise exhibits itself whenever you have a distinct event of electron transitioning. So you can say either an electron has passed or has something has happened to this electron or has not. It's the it's di differentiated from the case of where you have an electronic gas that's moving and overall that can induce any amount of charge. When you have a distinct transition, like when you have a junction, uh, a potential barrier, you either cross the potential barrier or you don't. And if you do, you have a charge of Q passing through the potential barrier, and if not, you have no charge passing through the potential barrier. And we saw <coughs> the power spectral density, the current power spectral density of shock noise, which is really due to the discreteness of these charge carriers is given by 2QIC, which makes sense. We expected it to be proportional to the current, because if there's no current, there's no fluctuation in the current. And also to be proportional to the charge carrier size, because if you had a huge charge carrier, if you imagine that the electronic charge would be very large, then you have more of this effect, because the same amount of current would exhibit like bigger pulses and longer period periods of silence. And if you have smaller charge carriers, it becomes more granular and more continuous. So the, the shot noise was there too. We saw that we talked about a couple other kind of noise sources, like popcorn noise, where you have some dominant trap energy. And then what you have, the power spectrum is a Lorentzian. Basically, you have a flat region, it's like a low pass energy spectrum. So it comes in and drops. And then we saw that if you have a large number of traps with different time constants, where the size, that the time constants were inversely proportional, the number of time constants were inversely proportional to the size of the, the time constant itself. The number of traps with a given time constant, so inversely proportional to the time constants, then you basically that results in a power spectrum that is the one over f. So this is a power that's one over f. So and, and that is exhibited in a lot of devices, but particularly in, in devices, uh, is it particularly pronounced whenever you have two different materials coming together, and that's where the area that the current is carried, particularly MOSFETs, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. So this really comes from imperfections of the systems and the lattice. So anything that induces imperfection in the crystal particularly can induce a lot of flicker noise, or one over F noise, the same thing, um, if the current is carried in that region. So if your current is carried in a region where you, for whatever reason, you have a lot of, you can have a lot of crystal imperfection. You have damage to the crystal structure or something like that, or there's an interface or something like that. Then you have a lot of Otherwise, you'll have a smaller amount. And I'll get into the details of this today. So what we'll do today, we'll talk about specific noise sources in our active devices. And in particular, we'll talk about junction diode, 
bipolar transistor, and a MOSFET. Those are the active devices that we deal with mostly. And we'll see what the noise sources are within, within each device. And uh, using these noise sources, then we'll see how we analyze the noise in the circuit and determine what is the mechanism, how, what is the parameter to evaluate the capital. So let's start with the junction dial. So we have PN junction dial. So a PN junction dial, as we've talked about before, you can have a period of PN region. You can have a basically P and N, and then your potential barrier. Well, it's the other way around, actually. So you have a potential barrier, electrons can pass. Some of them pass, and some of them turn around. Same thing with poles. You have poles here, and some of them that have enough energy can go through, and the ones that don't have enough energy will bounce back. So the ones that go through induce a certain amount of, there's a very clear amount of charge going through, which is Q, which is the electron charge, 1.6 10 to the minus 19 coulomb, goes through. So either for every electron or every hole that goes through, either that amount of charge goes through, or it doesn't, if it's bounce back. So <coughs> we expect to see shock pumps, right, because of that, because it's a very distinctive. Now, what, the question is, by the way, what is the small signal model of a diode, of a PN junction diode? We all know that. But it's, it's, if you look at this IV characteristic, of course, again, this is out of refresher, to refresh your memory, versus V diode, you have an exponential, right? So, from a small signal perspective, if you look at an operation point, some current, IDQ or IDC, and VDQ, so you have an operation point at which you can linearize this thing. And the slope of this line is what we call the conductance or resistance of the style. What is the conductance of this diode? I mean, we've calculated this before. This RD, the resistance diode, is VT over ice DC, or IC, or IC cubed, more accurately. And we saw that this basically comes from the exponential behavior, because you have ID was written as IS E to VD over VT, and if you differentiate, it's basically DID DVD, which is 1 over Rd, by definition, is going to be simply, um, you can see it's IC cubed over Vt, and therefore you have that resistance. So the way you can think about the diode, the, the intrinsic part of the diode, you can think about it as a resistance Rd. This is similar to an R pi or Gm. These are incremental resistances in the small signal model to represent the fluctuation, the variations in the thing. Now, in addition to that, any practical diode is made of superconductor material, so it's, there's some physical resistance here. So only, it, it's not a superconductor, so it's made out of some stuff, and the connections and everything has some physical resistance. You can call it RS. So now, if I ask you, which one of these guys, do you think any of these guys would represent, would show thermal modes, Johnson modes? What would you say? RS would show Johnson modes because that's a physical dissipated term. RD, however, doesn't. Because that's not a dissipated term, that's a derivative. So there is a noise source associated with RS. You could represent it as a voltage or current, which is basically, you can say, V um, thermal squared over delta F. The power spectral density is 4 kT RS associated with that guy. Should make sense. Now you, have, you said you have shock noise, right? The shock noise is represented as a source in parallel, you could represent it as a current source, to a parallel with Rd. And this source is going to be 2QID, or ICQ, the DC current. So that's the shock noise. And any semiconductor material basically, at some level, has some imperfections. And because of that, you basically have some level of flicker rules. It may be small. Usually, in MOSFETs and in, in a PN junction diode and bipolar transistor, it's at the lower level than MOSFETs, but it still exists, the flicker noise. So the flicker noise can be modeled as a, as a parallel source. Again, IF squared over delta F. And the power spectral density of, some, of the flicker noise is usually some constant I to some the current to some factor alpha, this is not, this is just not some exponent, exponential parameter, over f. So you can, you can see the one over f over here. So these are the three
three dominant noise sources in this device. These two, for the frequencies of interest, we can assume that they are white, more or less. But we know that this actually has a power spectrum which depends on the transit time. We talked about this, right? It has a sync squared profile. Because the transition from one side to another is not instantaneous. So the charge from the outside, when looked at, doesn't really, the charge transitions don't look like impulse or current. They really look like some pulses of certain shapes. And because of that, this has some profile. The power spectrum next to the shot noise has some profile, which is the same square. And same thing with the Johnson noise, the thermal noise. But again, we are assuming for the frequencies of interest, these are really white. So these three sources are the ones that we will consider actually for. Well, the flicker noise is a low frequency term, and these two that are white. So overall, you have a term, a, free, a low frequency term 1 over f, and you have two things coming in for, to give you white noise as a function of frequency in the power spectral disk. So that's the basic dial. Now, once you understand the basic dial, then the PN junction transistor is relatively straightforward in most, for the most part because the core elements are similar. You can think about additional terms that occur in it. So, how about it? BJT. What are the noise sources inside of BJT? So a BJT consists of three pieces of semiconductor. We have an N plus P N, maybe N minus and N plus here, but let's think about this N. And then we know the energy, the energy band diagram looks like this when it's in the forward action. So you have you lower this energy band, energy barrier, so more electrons go and these electrons go down and they end up in the collector. Of course, these are hugely exaggerated, by the way. So just difference compared to the band gap. These differences are much smaller, but it's because of the exponentials that it, all of them are magnified. And we know also if you have these holes that are back injected, but they are not useful, so that's why we make this M plus and P, so that there are more electrons going this way than the holes. And this basically is part what part of the base current is for. So IV goes in, part of it is for the electrons that are back injected into the emitter. Part of it is to account for the electrons that are recombined with holes in the base and disappear. And a very small part of it is injected back into the but that doesn't matter. <coughs> These are the dominant parts. So now, if you have something like this, we know what the model for this is. We can start with a pi model or a t model. Let's start with a pi model. So you have an r pi. The key elements of the model are gm, v pi, where this is v pi. And you, you may or may not want to include r over here. It doesn't matter. So I'll just drop it out. So what noise sources do you expect to see? Well, let's think about, let's start with shock noise, for instance. Where do you expect to see shock noise? The base emitter, shock noise. Okay, so yeah, you can see shock noise there. Why is there shock noise? You have a barrier again for the electrons. Right, you have a barrier for electrons. So basically, the transition, you can overall think about it as this. Yes, there's shock noise here, and there's shock noise here, because you'll have a distinct transition event with the collector, which is more or less about the same size, due to the same electrons. So I can combine the two of them and think about the whole thing as a transition from the, elect from the emitter to the collector. The transition from the emitter to the collector is a distinct event. Either an electron goes from the emitter to the collector or it doesn't. Right? You can have like two-thirds of an electron going and one-third of it not going. Right? So because of that, you expect the collector emitter current to be um, also to exhibit shot waves. And where would that shot wave be? The collector and the emitter. So that's the bulk of the shot wave. So you can think about it as the shot noise source here. You can see IC squared over delta F, which is 4 of oh, it's 2 Q IC, the collector current. Fine. That's the shot noise of the collector. Where else do you have the state effects separate other than this? Right, you have a combination. So basically, there is a little difference between the emitter current and the collector current, right? Which is the base current. That base current, what does the base current do? The electrons that go into the base do one of the two things, mostly, for the most part, or one of the three things, really, 
about just two, two, the majority of them do more than two million. Either they are back injected into the internet across a junction, or they <coughs> are recombining, re are recombined with a hole. In either case, you have a distinct event where a certain amount of charge either goes or it doesn't. So that corresponds to base current, right? That, that's what the base current is. Base current is accountable. So there's fluctuation in that. And therefore, you expect to see a similar fluctuation in the base to the base shock noise. So giving you the base shock noise. So the base shock noise should be there. It's 2QIB. And you can see since IB is smaller than IC, it's a, I mean, by back to beta, the power of the shock noise is beta times smaller than that. However, you have to be careful. These are separate events. These are different events, right? In the, there are phys different physical mechanisms in the sense that the transition of electron from here to there is a different kind of physical event than a, an electron being injected back into here or recombining here. So there's, very, there's little correlation between these. So you can treat them as mostly uncorrelated. The correlation between these is very small. There is, it's not zero, but you can assume that it's uh, zero for capital calculation. It's very small, yes? Yeah, but the base current, the electrons that are coming from base, they can recombine the electrons that are intended to go from emitter to color. No, they, they combine with holes. They don't combine with electrons. Oh, yeah. So the, what happens is that you basically have these two sources. There is a little bit of a correlation. There is a little bit of a correlation because they can interact and, and the back injection also increases the number of electrons here and all those things, but it's really small. So for all, all intents and purposes, for our purposes, you can assume that it's, and it's a really assumption. You can assume that they are uncorrelated. Now, what else do we have? So, so do we expect to see shot noise anywhere else? No, because we've covered it, right? We have like three currents that are two major flows of current, right? One is this, this is the primary flow of current, and then this is the secondary flow of current, direction of current flow. So shot noise, that's, that's for the shot. Now, how about thermal noise? Do you expect to see thermal noise? Where? <coughs> Wherever I have physical resistance. Where do I have physical resistance? Where is my biggest resistance? Which one of the terminals exhibits the largest resistance R? Collector. Say again? Collector. Collector. Well, if I do it like this, yes, but then it's a really bad transistor to begin with, right? So what we usually do, we talked about this before, that we have a very thin layer of N minus, but then after that we have N plus. So yes, the there's some physical resistance here, but you try to make it really, you make the transistor such a way that that's small, because otherwise you'll drop a lot of your voltage swing across them to begin with, so your transistor will be consume some of its own gain. It's not true. So for practical transistors, that resistance is actually very small. It's the so the largest resistance is seen where? Yes. The base, because it's thin and long, and the current flows in this direction, right? So this resistance, and when you did your calculations for that transistor last quarter, when you did analyze all the parameters, if you remember, RB was the largest one. And then it's RC, and then R and is very small, because it's an N plus feature. So that's the, the smallest one. So out of these three, if you were to take one into account, it should be RB. For two reasons. One is that it is actually the largest resistance. And the second reason, which makes it even more significant, is that any signal here, you have a lot of gain in, from here to there because of the common emitter com configuration. So any noise that you have here will get amplified by the gain of the transistor. Right? If you have something there, then that gets amplified. So that's why the base resistance is very important. We, I kind of like alluded to this, mentioned this briefly when we were talking about base resistance. So base resistance is important for several things. One of the most important things is the noise. Because if and you, you really want to make a transistor such that the base resistance is as small as possible, and that was one of the reasons to go to a heterojunction, because you could increase the base doping concentration without losing the, on the gamma, the back of injection efficiency, and losing, lowering your beta. That's what allowed you to have a higher concentration to concentration here, and use, a, get a lower waste resistance. And the main advantage of that is that you can get lower noise. But nonetheless, I mean, there's a fundamental trade-off, some of the fundamental trade-off here, because you really want to make the space thin for the transistor to operate as a faster device. So when you make it thin, there's so much you can do about it. So there is some limitation there. Anyway, so now this base resistance exhibits some thermal noise, right? So what is this thermal noise? You can model it as a series voltage source 
for a parallel current for a series voltage source is probably a better representation here. It's 4KT R. Now, in addition to these, uh, and you can if your collector current is large enough, the collector resistance is large, whatever you have a physical resistor. <coughs> now, well, let me ask you this question. How about R pi? Does R pi represent any noise? No, it's not a dissipative element. It's not something that dissipates energy by itself. It's a, a, a derivative, really. It's nothing but a slope at some point. It's 1 over dIB dBC. So that doesn't have any thermal noise. Now, how about, OK, so those, those are the sources of thermal and shock noise. And then how about flicker noise? Well, you can have flicker noise in this any device, basically. You can, practically most devices have flicker noise. And it's usually modeled, you can model it as a current source of the input. So this is I f squared over delta f. And again, it's on k i to the alpha over f, similar to the diode. So you have like some flicker noise at the input. Again, that's the way you model. Any questions? Let's see if I have any Okay. Alright. So those are the noise sources that you need to take into account for the most general case. Sometimes I come and tell you, well, ignore the flicker noise and just calculate the effect of the thermal noise or the shock noise. And that makes it simpler. Sometimes you know that you're dealing with things at high frequency. If it's an amplifier at very high frequencies, then you don't really worry about the flicker noise that much because it's a low frequency thing and the high frequency just drops the frequency. So a lot of times you just worry about those, depending on what you're doing. However, if you're making some instrumentation device that is operating at very low frequencies, then the flicker noise can be your dominant source of noise. And that's one of the things that you need to deal with. And minimize and cancel, and there are noise cancellation techniques and things of that sort that you can deal with. Does flicker noise go up uh, when you have uh, HVT? What do you mean go up? Um, compared to what, sir? Uh, compared to a regular VGT. I mean, is, is because of... You mean HVT? Yeah. Oh. In an HVT versus a VJT. Right. Yes, you have a little bit more flicker noise in HVTs if they were <coughs> not exactly the same as a because your base has more, you kind of like is a more heterogeneous structure and it's more prone to having imperfections. However, it really this is a question of the quality of fabrication, or how good it's built, right? It's it's something that is not fundamental in the sense that it's just a question that makes it more difficult to practically do it. So if if you get a good fab, then you can reduce this to I mean, you can make everything clean and anneal everything properly. So, so that, that's for the BJT and the PN junction. How about the MOSFET? <coughs> what are the noise sources in the MOSFET? So how does the MOSFET work? Well, we've talked about this before. So a MOSFET, in a MOSFET you have a gate. You have, let's say it's an NMOS. You have a channel form under the gate, under this C aux. And in the pinch off region, you have a channel that goes <coughs> up to a certain point, and beyond that, you don't have any way. Uh, you, you basically have a region depleted of charge, and of course, the electrons go through, they, they drift through here, and then they basically just accelerate through this region where there's a large vector field. So, what's the equivalent uh, Swanson model for MOSFET? We've already done this. This is relatively simple. So, at low frequencies, it essentially Primarily looks like this. I mean, there are, there's a body effect too. Let's not worry about that. But you can pick it, put it in your model. Too. But this is the most basic part of a MOSFET, a GMBGS, and there's a GMBBS right next to it, which you can you can take into take into account if you want. So the most dominant part of a MOSFET noise. Let's say, what kind of noise do I expect to see? In a MOSFET, basically, I have a channel, right? I have formed a channel that's resistant. It's like a resistance. <coughs> so this channel resistance will exhibit some noise, right? And it's basically the fluctuations of this thermal properties of this channel that give you the noise. Now, what is the effective resistance of this channel? What is the effective charge fluctuation of this? You can do a similar integral to the one that we did. Do you remember when 
the, when we calculated the gate capacitance, we, we came up with the two thirds of, you remember the gate capacitance, CGS is two third WLC ox, right? There was a two third element there. And if you do that for a long channel standard non loss saturated device, what you see is that the channel can be represented as a resistor with a total noise or the total current noise of the channel, everything included, is going to be 4kT times 2 thirds GD0. And GD0 is the zero <coughs> resistance, zero voltage uh, conductance of the channel. So this is the resistance you see across the channel when the VDS is zero. So basically when the device is in tri region. And you can calculate for a long channel device, it's basically D, 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 S of uh, ID, which is, so what is ID? Mu and C ox over 2, W over L, 2 VGS minus VT, VDS minus VDS squared. G 
squared over delta f, which you can say is 4 kT rg. That's the channel, the, the gate physical resistance nodes. So you have physical resistance of rg, it gives you 4 kT rg, voltage power spectrum. Now, you also have flicker noise. You can have flicker noise. And the flicker noise, again, is modeled as a, another voltage source in the device. And the input you can model it, Vx squared over delta x. Now, where does this flicker noise mostly come from? <coughs> now, here you have a device that if you think about it, if you think about this area and magnify, what do you have? You have a region of silicon. And then you transition to silicon dioxide, which is your gate. Now this interface, down on the silicon side, you have a bunch of silicon atoms connected to each other, right? Bond, forming like this face-centered cubic lattice, which basically is that of diamond lattice. But on the top, they are like basically have these bonds that are dangling because it's going to the silicon dioxide, which is a more amorphous material. So you have these bonds that are dangling bonds, and they can serve as trap sites. So these are imperfections in the crystal. Now the challenge is that most of your electronic current, the charge, is carried close to the surface in a MOSFET. And that's why you can have a lot of possibilities for absorption or trapping of electrons and release of electrons. And that's why MOSFETs in general have much higher flower efforts. And by bipolars. You worry too much, you, you worry a lot more about the flicker noise, namely, uh, i.e., one ref noise, in MOSFETs than bipolars because of this. So, this flicker noise is important, and you see it there. So, now, and it turns out that you can actually, when you model it, it we can present as some Kf over C ox W over L, which is the total capacitance of the gate, times 1 over F. And Kf is on the order of the number of views. Often is 10 to the minus 24 <coughs> volt squares times times pair. That order of magnitude can be larger or smaller. So those are the, noise, the primary noise sources in a transit in a in a MOSFET. There are other noise sources there too, but you can basically um, think about these as the primary sources of noise in a MOSFET. Now. If you take these, the question is, all right, where, when do I have to worry about 1 over F noise? Let me ask this question. Let's, let's ask this question. I said 1 over F noise is important. Yes, it's larger in MOSFET. But at what frequencies does, is it important and what frequencies is it not important? At what frequencies is the noise dominated by the flicker noise and at what frequencies is it determined by uh, the white noise? So what we, one thing we can do, we can compare, for instance, the channel noise. Let's, let's forget about the gate resistance noise. Let's just assume that's not dominant. Let's say you have two dominant sources of noise. One is your channel noise. The fluctuations of electrons, the normal fluctuations in the channel. And then the other one is a flicker noise. So how do I compare these two? It seems that I'm comparing apples and oranges, right? Because I have a current source on the output and the voltage source at the input. So if I were to compare them, I have to translate both of them to the same place. And by the way, these things, things, these three things are mostly dominated <coughs> caused by three different physical mechanisms, right? So you expect them to be uncorrelated. So what would you say about um, how can I com compare this green source with this red source somehow? I have to make them into the same thing. Both of them have to be the same current sources at the same place or same voltage sources at the same place. So one thing I can do is say, okay, what is the source here? the output, for instance, due to that voltage source that would result in the same current source of the output that this current voltage source generates. In other words, I'm using superposition. I'm saying that I'm taking the effect of these things individually into account. I'm saying that if I had a voltage source here, it has some effect on the output. What is the current source I can put in here that would have the same effect? GM, just be careful about it. So it's cool. GM squared, right? Right? Because this is a VF squared. So this current source will be on that order. So if I wanted to compare these, I have to multiply it by the current, the conversion of this voltage to a current, which is done by the transistor, which is a gain on GM. And since it's a power, it's a GM squared. So now I have to compare these things. So, so I know two things. I have one current source that has 
this power spectral density because this is gn squared times kf over c ox wl 1 over f. These are constants in frequency, so that's 1 over f. It's dropping at 1 over f, so this is the log. It's a log plot, otherwise it just looks look like that. So log log plots are 1 over f looks like this, like a straight line. And then you have a the power spectral density of channels, which is like that. So <coughs> you can see that this frequency where these two lines cross, which is usually referred to as f corner, the corner frequency, the one over f corner frequency, is a good number to know because that tells you approximately around what free, above what frequencies the channel noise dominates and below which frequencies, which frequencies the flicker noise dominates. So if I calculate this corner frequency to be, let's say, one megahertz, and I'm making an RF device operating at like 10 gigahertz, then I know that I don't have to, if it's a linear device, like an amplifier, I don't have to worry about the flicker noise. If there's no upconversion of low frequency noise by modulation, like a mixer or an oscillator or something like that. If you just have an amplifier, you can basically get, say, okay, I don't need to worry about this really, but this is really not dominant. And if I'm operating at like one kilohertz, then I know that I really don't shouldn't optimize things for my channel noise. I really should optimize them for flicker noise. Because that's going to be substantially more dominant than the channel. So what is this quarter frequency? Basically, you can equate these two and calculate the quarter frequency. So this is how you can do it. So you can say, um, you can basically say, gm squared kf c ox w over l one over quarter frequency is where it becomes equal to this four kt gamma gd zero. So you can solve for Fc and it gives you something in terms of these parameters. Fc becomes gm squared over gd0 times kf divided by c ox wl 4 kt gamma. So you can see, and if, if you have a long channel device, this gd0 becomes gm, so this becomes gm. So for a large channel device, basically you have a GM term in there. Um, but it's some number. I mean, it can be different for different devices. It's a function, and it's not a function of the process, by the way. You have to think about this. It depends on the W over L you choose. You can make this corner smaller or larger for a transistor by changing its dimensions. You can use, if you if your flicker noise is a problem, then you can basically, how can you reduce the flicker noise? Look at, look at this in terms of the problem. So how can you lower this quarter frequency? Which parameters would you change if you want to lower the quarter frequencies? That is the only purpose. Increase the okay. increase the W, for instance, right? If you increase the W, you can increase the quarter frequency to some extent. Uh, it depends if you are fixed current or fixed voltage. If you have fixed current, then what happens is that you have a square root of W over L in here, which gives you W over L, so that W cancels, that W doesn't matter. How about L? So let me just express GM in its terms, as I said, well, we can do it that way or this way. But how about L? The L would help with both of these, because it lowers GM and lowers uh, the denominator here. So increasing the L, increasing the channel length, would lower your flicker noise. In essence, making a larger device makes it low, lower the flicker noise. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good thing, because you pay a price. What's the price? GM. The speed, right? Because your capacitance, and GM too. So you, use, you increase your capacitance and you lower your transconductance. So you pay doubly for the speed. So your FT is suffering. So it's not that, if I ask you a question, some, some people come and say, the flicker noise quarter of this process is one megahertz. That's meaningless in, in essence. What they mean is that for a typical device that I used in this device, or for the device that I picked, it was around one, one megahertz or 10 megahertz or whatever. But it changes. It's not a fixed parameter, as you can see, depending on the parameters of the transistor use. But it's a good thing to know. I mean, in general, whenever you're trying to evaluate something, that's a good thing to know. All right. Any questions? So, these three are the, the core devices that you use often, and there are other devices that for those also you can think about whenever, if I give you a new device, you should basically be able to think about what kind of 
those forces you would have. For instance, if I give you a vacuum tube, a triad, or a dial, let's say a, a, a cathode or an anode that you've seen before. So what kind of noise do you expect to see? Shot noise, dominant shot noise, right? Because you have two plates, an electron can go from one plate to the other, so either it goes or it doesn't, right? So you have shot noise there. It's even more pronounced, more easily seen. So it's dominated by shot noise. If you have some physical resistance in the series with the cathode and anode, then those generate thermal noise. So these things are the kind of things that you should be able to think about independently if you see it in your device and think about which one of these sources will be done. Do I have potential for a large number of trap sites? Do I have distinct transition effects? Do I have physical dissipative element in there? And each one of them tells you something about what kind of noise properties you have. Yeah. Um, because for the, for the uh, vacuum tube diode, uh, because now with one of them is an elevated temperature, right? Mm -hmm. uh, does that come into the picture somehow? Uh, either in terms of maybe different expression for a shot noise or it's not a dissipative element per se, but the electrons are a little bit more agitated, so to speak. Yeah, but the shot noise doesn't have a temperature dependence, right. if you think about it, right? It's TQ, 2QIC. Yeah. So the shot noise is not affected by that. However, if that element, basically, your animal, had a higher temperature, and if it has some, it does have some physical resistance, right? It's not a superconductor, so it does have some physical resistance. So the temperature that you should use for that physical resistance is not 300 Kelvin, it's whatever the temperature, elevated temperature is, like maybe 1,000 Kelvin or something like that. So if you have, let's say, for that part, you have a resistance for the anode, right? The, the noise of this resistance is going to be 4 kT Ra, but this T is not the same T as the environment. It's the T of that point, of that anode, <coughs> maybe much higher. That was another way, basically, what, why, what we did here. Basically, we introduced this gamma as a fudge factor, which was another way of saying that if you are at a different temperature. It's another way of increasing the temperature. But yeah, so, so but it doesn't affect the sharp though. Right, okay. So the sharp doesn't have temperature dependence. Yes. All right. Any other questions? No. All right. So let's take a little break.